This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcast that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to Episode 12 of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries both supernatural and natural, anything that's strange, odd, and makes you wonder, the claims and counterclaims from the perspectives of both faith and reason. And in this episode, we're talking about the secret Soviet doomsday machine. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, do Howdy Dom. Hi. So uh, first, I want to, as usual, r remind people to like uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on Facebook. We have a Facebook page uh, to retweet us on Twitter when we post our shows, to comment, to subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app and YouTube. And when you subscribe on YouTube, make sure you hit the bell to get notifications when we post a new episode. And please share the podcast with your friends to help us grow our audience and grow the community of listeners so that uh, we have very interesting conversations, especially in mysterious feedback which is coming up at the end of this episode so <clears throat> all that said uh let's talk about doomsday machines this is a, a nice back to the 80s uh sort of yeah. episode uh, so what what is this what is well let's first talk about what is a doomsday machine jimmy yeah well basically a doomsday machine is a planet killer it's a device that's meant to either exterminate all life on a planet or, I mean, it could exterminate, it could blow up the planet itself, but it's at least meant to exterminate either all life or all human life or at least human civilization. So maybe there'd be a few people who'd survive, but they'd be blasted back to the Stone Age. Um, and thus it would be, it would, it would effectively bring on a kind of secular doomsday. Um, these machines have appeared in fiction for a long time in a lot of different forms. Uh, sometimes they are uh, under the direct control of a person uh, who can like push the button and end the world. And sometimes they are depicted as operating automatically to where they're set to just go off if certain conditions are met without human, without a human having to push the button, without a human trigger. Okay. And so it's, it's not so much like Skynet, which is like a male, uh, malevolent AI takes its own action per se uh, because that's it wasn't designed to do that but sort right. of like more like whopper in uh um oh what's what was the movie now i remember the name of the computer um the one from the 80s where the kid accidentally hacks into war uh, games war games yes 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 oh my gosh mm -hmm. i can the trivia i remember and the things i don't remember uh which was designed to be a uh well i don't know if that was technically qualified but anyway we get the it was, idea. It was sort of. It was. It was definitely a big automatic defense system that had control of nuclear weapons. And right. The lesson of the movie was you can te you can save the world by teaching a computer tic tac toe. Exactly. That is that is the ultimate lesson. Yeah. Uh, we should have taught <laughs> tic tac toe to Skynet. Um, so uh, so we now we understand what a what a doomsday machine is, and and th they are technically possible to build. Right. I mean, these aren't just fantasy. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes people will look at, at science fiction concepts of planet killers and say, well, these are just ridiculous. These are impossible. But in fact, no, they're not. I mean, some planet killers you see in science fiction, yeah, there's no way we could build that. Um, and in some cases, maybe there's no way anyone could build that. But there are ways to at least destroy human civilization and pop, and even all human life on Earth. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those ways later. Okay. And they could be anything from uh, explosive devices to pandemics to uh, yeah. chemical means or, or the various ways to, to, to kill off everyone very uh, completely. 
the easiest ways for us to do it with our level of technology would either be a biological plague that kills humans and is unstoppable, or what's even more within our reach is just launching tons of nuclear weapons. Right. Um, at one point, you know, back in the 80s, both we and the Russians had just incredibly vast thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons. And if we'd set them off all at once, it would have really caused a big problem. Um, but there's a special kind of bomb that we'll be talking about where just one bomb could do the whole thing. Ooh. Okay. I want to hear about that. But first, uh, why would, why, if you're going to, if it's, if, why would you build a gun that can kill everyone at once? <laughs> Basically, like, because yeah. that seems like a bad idea for the person pulling the trigger. Yeah. Well, it could be, um, is something that, uh, a, a megalomaniac would do. You know, you see in science fiction the kind of yeah. Bond villain strutting megalomaniac. If, if if the world doesn't bend the knee to me, I'm going to kill everybody, and I don't care if I go to. Um, you know, that's less likely, though, because not a lot of strutting mega, megalomaniacs have the resources to build a doomsday machine. Um, another possibility is a group of people with an extreme apocalyptic ideology mm. where they think it's their job to bring on doomsday um, could do this. Uh, and we know groups with ideologies like that exist. Um, I mean, Charles Manson and the Manson family, basically he thought it was the family's duty to bring on Armageddon, literally mm. um, a race war that he called helter skelter um, and, you know, various uh, Muslim sects have an ideology where they need to bring about the, the, uh, the end times as they understand them. And, you know, I remember back in the 80s, people would even, some, some people would get suspicious of evangelicals and say, oh, they think it's, they think they need to usher in the second coming of Christ by bringing on the end of the world. And that played into mm -hmm. some Cold War fears then. That, of course, was totally ungrounded. Evangelicals don't have that view. Um, but a single person, regardless of their perspective, could, as a, like, let's say, a rogue military officer, could have an apocalyptic ideology and, and go off the reservation and order an attack that could start a nuclear war. Right. Uh, that was something the Pentagon started worrying about in the 1960s, and it became the basis of the movie Dr. Strangelove, um, where an officer uh, named a general, Air Force general named Jack T. Ripper does exactly that. Uh, and we'll be talking about that a little more later in the episode. The, the most realistic reason, though, why someone would build a doomsday machine is as a deterrent strategy. Uh, one of the things that got really worked over during the Cold War was the game theory. Uh, game theory is the study of how, you know, obviously how do you win in a given scenario and how do different scenarios affect the competing parties' interests. And so a lot of work was done on game theory during the Cold War. And in contemplating the use of nuclear weapons, one of the big questions that had to be settled was when do you strike? And there are basically three options. The first is you strike first before the other guy has a chance. You do a first strike. And in a global thermonuclear war, you would want this to be a massive first strike that's going to take out as much of your enemy's uh, ability to strike back as possible. Um, if you don't want to do a first strike, though, the next option is launch on warning. So as soon as you have credible reports that there are missiles in the air coming your way, mm -hmm. you don't wait for them to land. That's when you launch your missiles. Um, there are some problems with the launch on warning strategy, though. One of them is uh, in, the, in the actual Cold War, America at one point had missiles that were within 10 to 15 minutes of the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. And that meant they would have just a vanishingly brief amount of time to verify, are these reports real or, or are we, as happened on one occasion, watching a flock of geese that just happens to have a radar echo that looks like a missile? Um, they wouldn't have hardly any time to make that decision. 
And consequently, they could make bad decisions. They might decide not to launch, in which case their entire leadership could be decapitated. All the leaders could be dead and there would be, and there would be chaos and nobody to send the order to launch a counterstrike. Also, one of the things they found out in the Soviet Union when they did drills, um, as you know, like surprise ones, people didn't know it was a drill in advance. They found that a lot of the underlings might not execute their orders. Uh, so they would send like a warning message to all their guys in the missile silos saying, this is it, we're under attack. And the underlings, instead of launching, would get on the phone to try to confirm, is this real or not? Mm -hmm. And well, um, In fact, that was uh, the, the premise to War Games, the movie. Like the very beginning showed us mm -hmm. one of these uh, drills in which the U.S. Uh, missile officers, one of them wouldn't launch. And then they revealed that many of the many of them didn't. You know, uh, yeah. in this drill. Right. Yeah. And that's human nature. Um, there are even, you know, a lot of the people who were involved in a lot of this uh, leaders and stuff during the Cold War later said, you know, I don't know if I would launch or not. Even if even if my country was being destroyed, what's the point of destroying everything else? Right. Um, at that point. So uh, so there were real worries about whether the counterstrike would actually happen. And then that leads us to the third option, which is launch on impact. Once you've actually absorbed some damage, you know for a fact that the bombs are going off. It wasn't a flock of geese. It wasn't a computer glitch. You really have bombs going off in your homeland. That's when you launch a counterstrike. The problem there is a lot of your counterstrike may have been destroyed in that first wave. Also, you may have had a leadership decapitation. And once again, the underlings may not respond either because of confused communications or because they just don't want to launch. So um, that led to a couple of interesting developments. Um, one of them was actually the Internet. Hmm. Uh, the Internet was a originally uh, called the ARPANET, and it was a project of DARPA, which is a kind of government technological research and development think tank. And the idea was, OK, if we're in a nuclear war and we're taking active damage, bombs are going off in the U.S., they're going to be punching holes in our communications network. And that's going to produce a problem if you're in wherever you are, let's say a secure bunker somewhere, you're the president, you got out of Washington. And how do you communicate? with the people under your authority with all these holes punched in the communications network with, you know, telephone nodes being destroyed and things like that. And the solution they came up with was, well, what if we fragment uh, information into packets, like an email is, is when you send it, it's broken up into packets, and then it takes various routes to the destination server and it can and if one server is down somewhere it just routes around that by going to a different server and so um so you could hopefully maintain command and control through the arpanet by fragmenting your communications your orders into packets that then get routed around the nuclear blast sites where your communications grid is taking damage and this system proved so useful that eventually it was released to the public but people may not have been aware that that's actually how we got the Internet. It was a mm. byproduct of Cold War thinking. Um, the other way uh, of, uh, of, of dealing with some of the uh, launch on impact problems is to create either an automated or semi-automated doomsday machine, something that will go off and will kill your opponent if they attack you. And so if they then know that you've got a doomsday machine, and even if they decapitate your leadership, take out all your government and military leaders, there is still something, quite possibly an automated machine, uh, you know, with no human involvement, that will then fire the retaliatory strike that will take you out. And mm -hmm. so that's the most, quote unquote, sane reason that one might want to build a doomsday machine as a deterrent to being attacked nuclearly. Okay. So, so those, so those are our, the reasons why. Uh, so what, 
what doomsday machines have there been? I mean, we, we're 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 going to be talking primarily about the the Soviet the secret Soviet doomsday machine, but there there I, I guess that there's there have been some theories presented in the past. Proposals, and, yeah. Proposals, yeah. The first one was by a physicist named Leo Szilard. Uh, he was from Hungary. He also lived for a time in Germany, and then he eventually came to America. He was the guy, Leo Szilard, was the guy who first thought of the idea of using a chain reaction. Um, he had been reading an article uh, reporting on a speech by the by the uh, by the British uh, New Zealand, I guess British Kiwi um, physicist Lord Rutherford, who had been s saying, you know, it doesn't look like we'll ever be able to extract useful atomic energy from fissile materials. I mean, yeah, they 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 emit in uranium emits energy, uh, but it doesn't. There's no way to get much out of it. And um, because either a single atom releases a neutron or it doesn't. And, and Sillard thought, well, wait a minute. What if you could get one atom releasing a neutron to trigger another atom to release a neutron or a couple of them? And if you had everything set up right, you could have a doubling effect where, you know, one neutron gets released, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, and so on, until you have millions of neutrons being released all at once. And that chain reaction would let you extract nuclear energy from fissile materials. Uh, you could build a nuclear reactor to generate power, or uh, Sillard realized you could build a bomb. Mm -hmm. And he thought of this in 1933, the idea of a chain reaction, and it became practical just a few years later in World War II. So Sillard worked on nuclear weapons, and he was the first to propose the idea of a doomsday bomb design. Um, he said that you could create a bomb that would make, because one of the things that happens when atoms release neutrons is they activate, it's called neutron activation, they make nearby atoms radioactive and cha can change them from one element into another, or at least one isotope into another. And so he said, look, if we found an isotope that, say, had a half-life of five years, um, then we could set up a bomb that would make bunches of this half-life element as as the bomb is exploding it's releasing all those neutrons it's activating all of the material in itself and in its casing and if we can get it to turn into the right element then when it blows apart it will put fallout over all over the earth that will and with that 5 year half-life it'll kill everybody and so you could have one bomb that would literally end all life on Earth. And the element that ended up being proposed to do that is an isotope of cobalt called cobalt-60. Um, the reason that that five-year half-life is important is because, um, you know, what a half-life is, is the length of time it takes for a chunk of material to lose half of its radioactivity. That's why it's called a half-life. So it, it'll go uh, it'll initially it'll have all its radioactivity, then it'll have half, then a quarter, then an eighth, then a sixteenth, and so forth. Um, every time a new half life is reached, but different elements have different half lives, and generally the higher up the element is on the periodic table, the shorter its half life. So we've got like the very high elements, like one sixteen and one eighteen. They have these just very fractionally short half-lives. You can only make them for a few seconds before they radiate and break down into some lesser element. Well, the thing about those very short half-lives is they mean the f even if they kill some people locally, they're going to decay into more stable elements before they cover the world. Okay. And so they're not going to kill people long term. On the other hand, elements that have really long half-lives, um, yeah, they'll release neutrons over time, but not enough to kill you. Uh, right. Uranium, the standard uranium uh, isotope that we find in nature is like that. I mean, historically, it has a nice yellow co color, and people would paint their dishes with it. And even though it's uranium and it does emit neutrons, it emits them so infrequently 
that um, or and other radioactive particles, it emits them so infrequently that it doesn't hurt anybody. It's perfectly safe. Hmm. Um, so what you want, if you really want to kill a bunch of people, is a middle range half life, something that will let the the fallout go everywhere and still re- decay enough that it will kill people when it gets there. And so the idea of building a cobalt-60 bomb is uh, what makes the idea of a doomsday, or a similar one, is what makes the idea of a single doomsday device really possible. The good news is uh, they never built this. Um, It was just an idea that Sillard came up with for discussion, but uh, neither we nor the Soviets built at least a world-killing cobalt bomb. Is it possible to build? I mean, is it is it just yeah. a theory? So someone, how <laughs> how difficult would it be for yeah. someone to build one of these things? Uh, just, you know, to set, settle my mind a little bit. <laughs> um, it, it Well, it, it would be difficult. Uh, it's it's going to be harder than just building, say, a, a, a regular atomic bomb or even a hydrogen bomb. Okay. Um, but it's quite possible. Uh, but, we, I mean, the theory is easy. The the trouble, and that's true of atomic bombs across the board, understanding how they work and how to design them is the easy part. Mm. Getting the fissile materials you need to fuel them is the hard part. So like lots of people know how to build bombs, but never can. Lots of countries know how to build bombs, um, but they don't either because they don't want to or because they haven't figured out how to refine the materials you need right. to make a bomb. Like making your uranium bomb, um, you actually don't want the isotope of uranium that's most commonly found in nature. You want a very special one that you either have to make or purify. And um, and that's the hard part. Right. Uh, from my understanding is, is the creation of the, of the, of the bomb itself, not even just the radioactive material, but the technical specs for the, the the technical processes of even just building the casing and the and the 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 detonator are extremely technically difficult. Uh, it, yeah, although it depends on the bomb type. If you're yeah. using an implosion device, um, then yeah, it, it that's really hard to get a, mm. a sphere of fissile material to implode evenly all at once. Yeah. But <clears throat> if you're using a, a, a gun type nuclear weapon where you've got a piece of fissile material at one end and a piece of fissile material at the other end, and you just need to force them together quickly enough, like a bullet going through a barrel. Yeah. Um, that's actually pretty easy. Oh, that's, that doesn't make me feel better. But uh, <laughs> so let's move on from that. This is this uh, show is not necessarily going to make you feel better <laughs> until the very end. But uh, hopefully we'll have something something positive at the end. All right. So that's Doomsday Machine number one. What have we got for uh, Doomsday Machine number two? So this is uh, an expansion, a fictional one of some things that we've already talked about. Uh, it's found in the movie Doctor Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Uh, This is a Stanley Kubrick film from the 1960s, and it is a dark comedy. Um, It's considered a brilliant satire of 1960s Cold War thinking. And in it, uh, Air Force General Jack T. Ripper does order a a first strike on the Soviet Union. And so all these planes start heading towards the Soviet Union without the U.S. president having authorized this. So the U.S. president uh, immediately contacts the Russians. They send over the Russian ambassador. They get the Russian premier on the phone. And lo and behold, it turns out the Russians have built a doomsday machine that the Americans didn't know about. And so if they can't stop all those planes, um, this device is going to activate and kill everybody on the planet. And so um, the, the plot then becomes a race to stop the planes in one way or another. And they try different things to stop planes. And I I won't give away the ending of the movie. Um, It is very funny. Uh, But in the process of talking about the uh, the Soviet doomsday machine that the Russian premier has authorized to be built, um, the Russian ambassador explains what it is. He says, it's actually pretty simple. You get a set of bombs, you jacket them, in something he calls cobalt thorium G. 
And so uh, there's some realism here. I mean, mm-hmm. they're actually, they've picked the right element, cobalt. They've also got the element thorium mixed in there for some reason. And I don't know what the G stands for, <laughs> but, um, but they're trying to think realistically and, and they're basing this on, you know, things that people are actually talking about. This is essentially Leo Sillard's idea coupled with American fears about a rogue officer setting off a nuclear war. And so um, the Russian ambassador says that the machine, if activated, will you know explode these bombs, and then um, it will get, it will put the Earth under a doomsday shroud of fallout that will kill everybody. And the machine's already been activated; it cannot be deactivated. And uh, and at that point, the American president wants some independent confirmation of of what the Russian ambassador is telling him, and he turns to Dr. Strangelove. Now, Dr. Strangelove <clears throat> is a German scientist played by Peter Sellers. Interestingly, Peter Sellers also plays two other roles in this movie. He <laughs> also plays a British liaison officer to the American military, and he plays the American president himself. But since he's wearing a bald cap and does such a good American accent, I had no idea that was Peter Sellers <laughs> talking to himself as Dr. Strangelove for the longest time. Um, in any event, <clears throat> he turns to Dr. Strangelove and says, is this possible? And Dr. Strangelove says, oh, yes, it would be simple. Even the smallest nuclear power could do this. It just requires the will to do so. But then Dr. Strangelove asks the Russian ambassador a very important question. The whole point of the doomsday machine is lost. If you keep it a secret, why didn't you tell the world, eh? It was to be announced at the party congress on Monday. As you know, the premier loves surprises. <laughs> <laughs> so they were going to tell everybody, but uh, they didn't do it just yet. They activated the machine first. Surprise! Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you, uh, you may want to check out Doctor Strange Love for some uh, for some really impressive dark comedy about all the stuff we're talking about today. Um, fortunately, of course, the status of this one it's fictional; it was never built. But uh, something like it uh, would indeed be possible. And in fact, there were Russians were discussing building such a thing in the 1960s. Interesting, and as we'll see. Uh, later generations of the idea uh, kept the idea alive in the Soviet Union. But so yes, so so let's move on then to the to the next one, um, a, a, the next level of or the next uh, type of doomsday machine that we encounter in in this Cold War history. Yeah, so doomsday machine number three is something the details are pretty sketchy about. I learned about it a number of years ago. And I haven't been able to, in prepping for this episode, I haven't been able to find a lot of information about it. I was able to find a very short, like two minute video about it, a clip from a documentary that's on YouTube. And we'll have a link to that in in the show notes so you can watch it for yourself. But basically in the 1960s, um, Soviet military planners came to their premier, Nikita Khrushchev, with a with a proposal for essentially a Dr. Strangelove-like device. Um, The plan was, let's get a tanker, you know, a ship, a big ship with big cargo holds, and fill it up with fissile materials, uh, that is, materials capable of nuclear fission. Um, We're going to fill it up with these nuclear materials. We'll put it in the Arctic Sea, and it'll cruise around on automatic pilot, it will cruise around up and down the nuclear, uh, the northern border of Russia, and it'll be looking for bombs going off in the Soviet Union. And if it detects bombs going off in the Soviet Union, then the whole ship itself, as a bomb, will automatically detonate and kill everybody in the world. And so, a nuclear bomb the size of a, a tanker ship. Exactly. And uh, so they proposed it to Khrushchev, and he fortunately 
said no. <laughs> he thought it was too crazy. <laughs> and so, so the status of this one is it got, it never got built because Khrushchev nixed the idea. So that wow. was uh, that was really nice of him. I really appreciate that. The hand <laughs> pound, the pounding at the United Nations was a little rude, but nixing the the atomic bomb tanker, I, I approve of that. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Okay, so uh, but the the idea of uh, Soviet doomsday devices uh, did did not die with Khrushchev's tanker. Uh, we actually got closer than ever, didn't we? In the eighties, we not only got closer, we got there. Mm. Um, here's what was happening. So in the nineteen eighties, it was a really tense time in the Cold War, and one of the reasons for that was there was a generational shift that was about to happen in the Soviet Union. The guys who were the leaders at this time were all really old. They, you know, they they had been born early enough that they were either participants in the original in the original uh Soviet re- revolution or shortly thereafterwards they were involved and so they were the old guard of the Soviet Union and and they were dying off. They were getting really old le- leaders who you may have heard of who belong to this group include Leonid Brezhnev, uh, his successor Yuri Andropov, and his successor Konstantin Chernyenko. And there was a lot of concern about um, the leadership problems that having these super old guys in charge was causing because they were not in good health. Um, and that was, you know, that was, they were debilitated uh, during portions of their tenure. <clears throat> and it was such a concern that actually Yuri Andropov, when he was preparing to die, he he had a meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev, who was a, a young guy. He was part of the rising generation of Soviet leaders. And, um, and Andropov had been scheduled to give a speech that he couldn't give because of his health and he was dying. But he wrote uh, like a, uh, he wrote an addendum by hand. Uh, to his speech in which he asked the, uh, the the Communist Party leadership to consider replacing him with Gorbachev, hmm. not with the guy that was in the next position to move up, who was Chernyenko. Hmm. And so he was like going to – he knew Chernyenko was in really bad health, and he wanted to skip Chernyenko and go directly to the new generation. But – you know, Russian skullduggery. <laughs> so um, that got that uh, bit of his hand addendum got deleted. And so Chern- Konstantin Chernyenko moved up on schedule. Uh, they had Andropov's funeral. Margaret Thatcher came and she had had these fur lined boots because she was told she was going to have to stand in the cold for a long time at the funeral. And she thought, well, these are expensive, but looking at how unhealthy Chernyenko is, I think I may get to use these <laughs> boots again soon. And and Chernyenko was just, you know, really in a downward spiral at this point. He was, um, they were giving him things like note, his sentences on note cards uh, or his what he needed to say on note cards in really short sentences because he was suffering from really bad emphysema. And he he couldn't do long sentences. And then they apparently half the time he was just stumbling through the cards, not even knowing what he's saying. So <clears throat> this was a really bad situation and you mm-hmm. didn't have good leadership. And there were a lot of questions in all the tension with America at the time. How is this guy going to act in a crisis? Is he going to freeze up? Is he going to do something um, premature, you know, there's just not a lot of confidence in this guy. And so because of that, the Soviet military planners came up with a system that they hoped would mitigate the problems. Uh, and they called it perimeter. That's its name. It's also related to a system called, somehow related, to a system called dead hand. Mm-hmm. Um, although it's unclear what the relationship is. Some people say that dead hand is just another name for perimeter. Other people will say, no, dead hand was a proposed system that would have been fully automatic, but that they didn't build. Mm-hmm. What they did build was a semi-automatic doomsday system called perimeter. And and so the idea is 
um, <clears throat> they had built these control missiles. They were really good at rockets, and so they they built these missiles that could launch that didn't carry warheads. Instead, they carried communications nodes, and these communications nodes could then broadcast down to any rockets or to any missiles that had not launched and tell them to launch. Mm. So if the Soviet Union took a first strike, the idea was these communications rockets will launch and they'll tell all of the other rockets that do carry warheads to launch. So, uh, and that'll all happen automatically without any messy human meddling. Um, so you don't have to worry about officers either not getting the order or not obeying the order. So that part of the system is automatic. As soon as the communications rockets go, everything happens automatically. They launch all of their remaining missiles, and the U.S. suffers a massive, massive thousands of warheads strike, um, which is potentially enough to kill everybody on the planet um, <clears throat> due to fallout. Now, they didn't want this because they had had experience with mistaken signals like the famous flock of geese incident. Mm -hmm. um, there were others as well. And so they didn't want the system to be fully automatic. So they made it semi-automatic. And what they did was they said, OK, we will only turn on perimeter in a crisis. So this is different than the Dr. Strangelove scenario. In Dr. Strangelove, it's always on and you can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. Here, it is normally off and then gets turned on in a crisis. <clears throat> and so, say, the Kremlin would send an order turning on perimeter. And then there would be these guys who were constantly on duty in these little underground bunkers called globes. And they're so far underground, the globes are, that they would be impervious to uh, nuclear strike. And so the guys in the globes then have a checklist that they're going through that includes factors like, has perimeter been activated? Well, if it's been activated, have we lost contact with the leaders, mm. which would be a sign of, of decapitation? Right. Well, if, if, if we have lost contact with, if the system's active and we've lost contact with the leaders, do our seismic air pressure and radioactivity sensors tell us that bombs are going off? And if they say yes, okay, at that point, we launch the control rock. We launch the communications rockets. Hmm. And so they had a, a element of human involvement here. They no, Number one, they kept it switched off most of the time um, so that it would avoid accidents. And then they had a final check with the guys in the globes to evaluate stuff rather than leaving it to a computer that could break or be hacked or whatever. Um, and so th that was that was their uh, proposal for how this should work. They thought it would help them survive a decapitation, but still have a final human check. On the other hand, um, drawbacks include human error and uh, malfunctioning sensors and malfunctioning computers. So this system isn't absolutely safe either. What we do know is that unlike the previous ideas we talked about, they actually built this. It apparently went online like in 1984 or 1985. Yeah, just to add a, a bit, a very interesting um, contemporary uh, fact about this: um, the TV show "The Americans" was just just ended in this spring. It's a, uh -huh. it was about uh, a deep cover Soviet agents living in the United States uh, right. in the 80s, and the last season was uh, surrounding the the. The SALT talks, which was the, the nuclear disarmament talks between yeah, Gorbachev and Reagan. Strategic arms limitation talks. Yeah. And, uh, and, all, and then as elements of the Soviet leadership who were opposed to Gorbachev's reforms, who were trying to uh, create dead hand and put it online, mm -hmm. this fully automatic system, uh, and, uh, and the spies being tasked with the, the duty to, to get certain American technology, which they required. Um, and so there was it was it's very interesting that we're talking about this now and, ha and I haven't I've just I just watched the uh, final season of it uh, uh -huh. now. But the, the other thing that came up actually in that show and that we've kind of hit on here was that that flock of geese scenario, the necessity of having that human in the loop was there was this one Soviet colonel uh, rocket in the rocket forces, uh, the equivalent of the Str Str American Strategic Air Command. 
who, when when they got the signal that America had launched uh, missiles, everything in his training, everything in the protocols and procedures said, uh, we launch, we, you know, we launch back. Yeah, you know, that we, we should tell the Kremlin that the Americans have launched at us and that we need to need to launch our missiles. And he kept saying, why would they launch at us? Nothing's going on. There's no reason for them to have launched. But this can't be right. And so he against all his training and all possibilities of reprisals against him for disobeying his, his orders, his standing orders, he in the rules of engagement, he refused to, to, to take that step. And it turned out, yeah, it was just a flock of geese that fool, fooled the Russian uh, censors. And mm-hmm. this one guy sa- basically saved the world <laughs> by yeah. refusing to obey his orders. So and it just kind of in- r- reminds me of how important having a human in the system is uh, when you're when you're in nuclear brinksmanship. Yeah, and that's not the only case like that where one guy ended up preventing nuclear war. We'll talk about more in an upcoming episode. Yeah. Um, so so anyway, uh, they uh, the Soviets did build perimeter. And it's interesting, the U.S. actually had not exactly the same thing, but something that was a little bit parallel to it. Um, What we did was instead of building bunkers underground for guys to look for attacks, we put planes in the air. Right. Uh, The Air Force had, between 1961 and 1990, the U.S. had planes in the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They'd refuel in the air so they didn't have to land. And they they would fly certain routes looking for missiles, looking for explosions, looking for evidence that an attack was underway. This was called Project Looking Glass. And if um, they detected um, an attack underway, they had the authorization apparently to to uh, to get a counterstrike going. And so this was similar in function to perimeter, but it it wasn't quite the same. Uh, One difference between looking glass and perimeter is we told the Soviets about it. We said, this is what we're doing. This is what these planes are for. Don't worry about them. They're just monitoring. But if you attack us, this is what the planes are going to do. And so that uh, we let the Soviets know about it, and it's thought to have played a, a somewhat stabilizing role on uh, the situation in the Cold War. However, the Soviets didn't tell us about perimeter, which brings us back to Dr. Strangelove's question. The whole point of the doomsday machine is lost. If you keep it a secret, why didn't you tell the world, eh? <laughs> exactly so why didn't they and this is something that you know we don't because details of the perimeter program are needless to say classified by the russians and we don't have a lot of detail here um you know it's not entirely clear but the indications we have is that they actually were thinking a, a step ahead in game theory they weren't trying to deter us they were trying to deter themselves hmm. because you had these, you know, hotheads, uh, not, you know, you had like in any country, you had hawks and doves. And so the Russian hawks would want to say, OK, if we even see missiles coming, we've got to launch on warning. We've got to get those. Mis- we got to get our missiles up in the air so they don't get destroyed. But launch on warning is really problematic because of the possibility of a, of a mistaken launch. And then everything, you know, goes to pieces. So, um, so by building perimeter uh, that could be switched on in a crisis, the, uh, the Hawks would feel less impulse to launch on warning because, or launch a first strike because if you know you have a deterrent that's going to go off no matter what, then even if the enemy doesn't know about it, even if the Americans don't know about perimeter, if you know that perimeter exists, then you don't have to launch a first strike to prevent the Americans from doing one. You don't have or don't have the same pressure at any rate. Mm-hmm. You also don't have to launch on warning. You can wait to see if it pans out or not. 
and you'll still have the confidence that there will be a retaliation if the attack is real. And there are other elements that come into this as well that we won't talk about here necessarily that have to do with you know nuclear deterrent strategy, things like uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was something right. called Star Wars, and how that yeah. affected deterrent strategy and that sort of stuff. That's a whole – that's a different podcast altogether. Uh, yeah, that's a different episode. But uh, – so, so – go ahead. So the, basically, that's the story of Perimeter, and the thing is it's still active. Mm. It's still out there. The Russians have maintained it and upgraded it, and uh, so – uh, fortunately, I don't think it's switched on at the moment, but one day it could be. And and like you said, with Looking Glass, I mean, the, America, you know, still has um, an, the it, Airborne National Airborne Operations Center, which is a, the National Command and Control uh, system for Strategic Air Command. Uh, although since the '90s, uh, early '90s, it doesn't fly twenty four seven anymore like it used to, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but but you know America still has some of that deterrence built in, and there may be it still be stuff that we haven't heard of that's se- American secret in America, um, right? So that kind of is our usual our, our usual uh, way of approaching the subjects is uh, we we took look at the reason perspective and the faith perspective, and you know going through the different doomsday machines we, was really the reason perspective on this. Yeah. Uh, so what what is what does our faith have to tell us about? About doomsday machines in general, what is what is the Catholic teaching on 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 the acceptability, the morality of a doomsday machine? Yeah, well, so I'm not aware of any magisterial document that directly addresses doomsday machines. Um, as far as I'm aware, no pope or ecumenical council has specifically said doomsday machines are bad. <laughs> However, um, Catholic moral theology would definitely hold that attempting to end the world is bad. Right. Um, also, uh, and, you know, attempting to kill everybody on the planet, that's bad. Um, also, from a faith perspective, you know, we believe as Christians that Jesus Christ is coming back. There's going to be a second coming. So even if somebody built a doomsday machine and even if somebody triggered it, um, that Jesus would still come back, at, at, presumably right at that moment, and uh, and and things would end well. Uh, after all, um, you know, not the, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth, and there's prophecy the current earth is going to uh, be burned with fire. So you know, who knows? There could be a doomsday like machine involved, maybe. Mm-hmm. But it's not something the faith teaches. But what the faith does teach is that Jesus Christ is coming back and that those who are open to God's grace uh, will be saved eternally. So um, so that's good. That's good news, definitely. In terms of thinking a little more uh, deeply about the principles of nuclear deterrence that are involved here, the church has for a long time condemned the use of weapons of mass destruction, whether they're chemical, biological, or nuclear. Um, it also specifically condemns targeting civilians deliberately, you know, saying we're gonna we're gonna kill innocent people here as a way of putting pressure on their government or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that seems to be a key aspect of nuclear deterrence. So actually using weapons for those purposes is very morally problematic. But using a weapon and having a weapon for purposes of deterrence is a slightly different question. And on the latter question, um, John Paul II, uh, Saint John Paul II now, gave a speech back in 1982, the same time frame we're talking about, where he was addressing the General Assembly of the United Nations, and he talked about deterrence. And he said this, in current conditions, Deterrence based on balance, so that would be maintaining parity between the parties, certainly not as an end in itself, but as a step on the way toward a progressive disarmament, may be judged morally acceptable. So he's saying that um, that having a deterrence as a temporary measure with hopes of finding a way to, to disarmament, that can be morally acceptable. Um, Nonetheless, he says, in order to ensure peace, it is indispensable not to be satisfied with this minimum, 
which is always susceptible to the real danger of explosion. And I assume he's not punning there. Right. Um, he, he means the situation could become unstable. Uh, so, um, so according to John Paul II, you could have nuclear weapons or other weapons as a deterrence um, in a situation where there's parity between you and the other party and where you're working on a way to get out of this situation to where you're 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 both you've both renounced such weapons and if that principle holds uh on the scale of weapons we're talking about then hypothetically you could have a temporary situation where it could be morally justified to have um and I'm not endorsing this, and I'm not saying this is my view. I'm just mm. speculating based on the principle he articulated. I could I could see some people saying, well, um, if we're in a situation where they've got a doomsday machine, it's morally legitimate for us to build a doomsday machine, too, as a form of deterrence. And then maybe we can find a way to walk back from that situation. Right. Um, so, you know, there'd be a lot more thought that would have to be put into that. But um, but it's something that that does involve a principle of deterrence that's not something everyone thinks about instantly. Okay. So all this taking all this into account, all all everything that we've discussed. What's the bottom line about uh, doomsday machines? The bottom line is doomsday machines are possible, uh, and they're extraordinarily dangerous, and they're extraordinarily scary. And in my personal opinion, I would love to live in a world that doesn't have any. Mm. That uh, it would be nice to that in in, in the uh, the disarmament talks that are constantly going on among the world powers. That this yeah. should be part of that discussion. Uh, I yeah. would I would be in agreement with that. So yeah. uh, we're going to have a bunch of resources in the show notes uh, uh, about this whole topic. Um, mm -hmm. Including some books you can read about it. One called The Doomsday Men uh, by Peter Smith is about Leo Sillard and the other people who, who developed these ideas. There's another book uh, called The Dead Hand by David Hoffman that not only talks about perimeter, but also talks about, and The Dead Hand, but that also talks about extensively about the bio-warfare uh, preparations that the Soviet Union made and how Reagan and Gorbachev negotiated um, a, a walk back on everything mm -hmm. and how we then got access to what was going on in Russian bioweapons labs and the amazing things we found there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to sleep tonight, so maybe I'll yeah. <laughs> look at that one. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> excellent. Uh, uh, this has been a great discussion. Uh, I really enjoy, the, enjoy this, not just because I lived through some of this time, but uh, it, it's fascinating to learn about things that were happening uh, when you were alive and you were aware of them. Uh, so th that brings us to mysterious feedback. Uh, we, we've been hearing, uh, like, uh, like we have from the beginning, we've been hearing from listeners. Uh, and so we'd love to discuss some of your feedback. We've got a, uh, a comment from YouTube from Alejandro Banuelos. Alejandro. Alejandro. I know I, I'm terrible at the, at the accent. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> and he says, um, I love the X-Files. And they did a very good job in keeping our curiosity alive on the unknown and mysterious. Keep this curiosity alive, guys, and with a Catholic view of uh, point of view is amazing. Or keeping it alive. Uh, yeah. Th thank you, Alejandro. That's that's great. Yeah, that's great. Uh, glad you're enjoying the program. And and uh, I think uh, I know that uh, we both we both love the X Files too. So. Yes. <laughs> so excellent. Seen every episode. Seen, well, there was one I didn't watch because I thought it, it would be too disturbing. But every <laughs> other episode I've seen, even the bad ones. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then from Twitter, Ashley the Texan. Uh, I love Texas. Uh, my wife is from there, so that's why. Uh -huh. uh, she has uh, uh, Ashley uh, sent us this mes message. She says, uh, these episodes have been really interesting. My husband and I are both listeners. Well, uh, great to hear from you, Ashley. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, Thank you. And please share the show with others so there can be even more listeners. And uh, and we love hearing your comments, especially uh, when you send, you know, ideas or interact with points we've made and things like that. It's uh, great to hear from everybody. Yeah, actually, I want to emphasize that point. There's something you just said. 
Uh, if you have ideas for future episodes, for topics we could cover, I mean, we've got a list already of over 150 different possible yeah. topics, and, and Jimmy and I are adding to them every day. But, you know, we don't know everything. So if you've got uh, some uh, an idea for a topic uh, to cover, please send that along uh, in in all the various methods. I'll, th- I'll tell you about them in a second. Uh, after we talk about uh, mystery headlines, what are our mystery headlines this week, Jimmy? So in Mysterious Headlines, the first one is a story. It's not headlined this way, but I I personally would have headlined it, My Mom the Neanderthal, (laughs) um, which is a sentiment that a lot of young teenage girls may have at times about their moms. (laughs) Um, But in this case, it's real. Uh, Scientists have discovered some bone fragments from a prehistoric girl whose parents belonged to two different subspecies of humans. Mm. Uh, Her mother was a Neanderthal and her father was a Denisovian. So neither one, neither of her parents were Homo sapiens sapiens. Neither one were our species or subspecies of human. But um, she had mixed parentage. Normally, and what's fascinating about this find is that we know it was her, her mom and her dad. Normally, when we find evidence of crossbreeding between different human subspecies, um, it's like in the distant past. So it'll just be a tiny trace of Neanderthal DNA or something like that. One of your ancestors thousands of years ago did it, um, you know, mated with a Neanderthal or something. This, though, is it's her mom and her dad. So this is a first generation crossbreed. Hmm. Um, and that's ex- it would be extraordinarily rare for us to find this. So it's a very interesting discovery. And we have a link to an article on New Scientist about that. Okay. Also, uh, we have an article from Vox.com about why we haven't found aliens. That's that something sounds... we were talking about a couple of weeks ago with the yep. Fermi paradox. And so um, this article goes into some ideas that we really didn't have as much of a chance to go into, like the Drake equation, which is a way of guesstimating how common alien technological civilization should be. And so if you want to learn more about that, you can check out that article from some perspective. Uh, Then in Popular Mechanics, we have a link to an article on a Kindle satellite Hmm. that's, that's been proposed. So as you may know, a Kindle device, one of the Amazon reading devices, at least the the classic versions, have um, a kind of electronic ink that uh, they use, which is very low power, and it forms words on your screen by, like, flipping uh, flipping a small element that's black on one side and white on the other. And um, and this uh, guy in this article has proposed that we cover a satellite with not that exactly, but something that works on the same principle. The reason is um, it would enable satellites to um, have better temperature control hmm. because if you're if if part of the satellite is color is actually very important on satellites. That's why they tend to be um, like either silver or gold or white or things like that. So they reflect sunlight um, rather than absorb heat because they don't have the atmosphere to protect them and stuff. Right. And so um, so heat management is a big issue in satellites. And so the idea is, let's say you're facing the sun, you could flip the little elements to white to reflect as much of the sun's rays as possible. But then the part of the satellite that's faced away from the sun could have them flipped to black to... Um, to help manage heat on that side by like yeah. letting more heat in, say from Earth shine. Hmm. Um, also, this has the potential to even help with the maneuvering of the satellite because light pressure can be used on the principle of a light sail to help move even spaceships around. And hmm. so the satellite, by adjusting the color of its skin, could potentially get little nudges like a little bitty light sail from the uh from the rays of the sun that's fascinating wow yeah I think of this uh great so those are three headlines and we'll have the uh, links in our show notes uh for you to check them out uh very interesting stories there so uh that i think that sort of wraps up for us i want to re- uh, reiterate for you folks 
to please to like uh, the show wherever you see it on whatever social media uh, your platform you see it to write us reviews wherever you find the show on iTunes and Google Play and the various places to uh, send us your comments to subscribe to the podcast uh, either as a podcast feed or uh, as a YouTube we, we post these on YouTube as audio uh, vi- you know, videos that are audio only with an image uh, and then make sure you get notifications and please, as Jimmy said, share the show with others. If you're enjoying this, chances are other people are going to enjoy it too. And uh, that w- that's it from us now. Uh, we want to hear from you, though. What do you think about the the secret Soviet doomsday machines and the concept of, uh, of these doomsday machines? Let us know by going to sqpn.com or the SQPN Facebook page or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Leave us some feedback there on the show, the, 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 that's the post for the show there, or send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Uh, you can send a written email, you can send an uh, a, a audio email, uh, like attach an audio file uh, to, to your email so we could, we could even hear your voice, just like we heard Dr. Strangelove on today's episode. We can hear your feedback. Uh, you can find links to all of the resources and the headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com as well as links to our social media and uh, our websites until next time jimmy aiken thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world thank you don once again i'm don bettinelli thank you for listening to jimmy aiken's mysterious world this is don bettinelli again we hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcasts you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com give. That's sqpn.com give.